Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian and Ekin, and uh, also Adrienne for inviting me to give this talk. I'm extremely excited, actually. Um, I'm also curious to see how it will turn out to be. This is something that uh, has been a very big passion in my life for the last few years, and uh, I'm really trying to create and transmit a culture of reproducible research. And uh, yeah, I hope that uh, at the end you will also share a bit this uh, vision that I have. I have no uh, financial interest or relationship with this uh, presentation, and I released this under a CC BY license, so in case you want to get any slide, just get in touch and we will, uh, uh, we will talk about that. So what is reproducible research? Um, I will not make a survey here, it's a bit, uh, would get overwhelming, but who knows, uh, by show of hands, who knows what, reproduce what we mean by reproducible research? Uh, okay, oh, a few, not everybody, maybe somebody's asleep, but not everybody. So I will uh, give you my answer and then you can consider if it's the same answer that you would have given. Um, imagine let, that I run this study. Um, can you hold your P? How, how good are you at holding your P if you can uh, be good at it? Can you, can you stay long hours without going to the bathroom? And uh, maybe yes, maybe not. What if I told you that I found out that uh, uh, how good you are at holding your P is in no way related to how good you are at managing money? So there is no correlation here. Then I am going to make you a gift for a couple of minutes, you are now all editor-in-chiefs of uh, your own journal. Uh, so congratulations, professors. Uh, would you publish this research? So I come to you and say, I found out people who can hold their P, yeah, they really have no association with how good they are with money. Would you publish this? Let's say maybe a few of you m would, but most of you probably wouldn't, so put Drake. You found out that there is no correlation, p-value is higher than 0 0.05, not really good, uh, but if the p-value was lower than 0 0.05, then this would really be nice. And indeed, p-value was lower than 0 0.05, it was 0 0.03, and uh, this got published. But uh, of course, the correlation existed, so if you're good at holding your p, congratulations, you're also good at managing your financial assets, and uh, you will be a very successful human being in the years to come. At least this is what the study shows, no? So I guess that it wouldn't have been published if this hadn't reached this fantastic 0 0.03 uh, threshold of 0 0.05, we will come back to that. Is it a problem? So XKCD, does everybody know XKCD? I guess yes. This is a bit a longer comic, so let's try if jelly beans cause acne and initially there is no correlation. And then you go and try the yellow jelly beans, the purple jelly beans, the brown jelly beans, you try. At some point there is something that comes 0 0.05 and then what happens? Wow, we found that green jelly beans cause acne and the confidence is 95%. I mean, how can this be a mistake? This, there is just no way. And actually <laughs> it turns out that this is a problem because we ran 19 tests and they were all negative and then the 20th came up positive and this is perfectly normal even if there is no signal. And then in 2005, John Ioannidis, maybe uh, one of the most known people in the reproducibility field, uh, wrote this paper saying that uh, most published research findings are false and uh, the, he demonstrated that with statistics. So yeah, it must, must be legit. And the, the, the statistics checked out to be okay and uh, this also became uh, uh, something in popular culture. This uh, was taken by uh, news uh, outlets and uh, YouTube videos. Um, and it turns out that it was really like that, uh, that uh, a lot of uh, papers were published and uh, what they were claiming was not corresponding to reality. And uh, one of the problems is exactly this, that uh, we are only wanting to, oh, <laughs> we, we would like to publish everything. The publishers end up wanting to publish only the results that are striking. And in a way is also interesting. I mean, you cannot just test everything and then uh, uh, just publish everything. It would be just too much noise. So you have to select, but 
the problem is that by inducing this uh, uh, distortion towards positive findings, then uh, you're also encouraging researchers, consciously or unconsciously, to self-censor, uh, uh, play a little bit with their data until they manage to get this uh, fatidic 0 0.05 uh, uh, p-value that can, that can get their study published. So sometimes this is malicious behavior, sometimes it's just uh, naiveness. We convince ourselves that this is the right thing to do, that data point is really an outlier, and then everything turns out to be okay. Um, but uh, then you can imagine, uh, we get studies that are published. I'm not saying that the P study is bad. I mean, may um, maybe, it's, maybe it's true, but it might also be bad. There is really no way to know. And uh, what can we do? So the only thing that we can do to make sure that this doesn't happen is that all our studies are published and are accessible. So we don't uh, put our uh, studies in the drawer. And then we also have to be transparent with our methods and our data, so not just uh, uh, publish everything, but also publish how we did things. So my answer, what is reproducible research? It's not just open source. Someone thinks that it's just open source, or someone thinks that uh, it's about uh, making one, making sure that if I have one method and apply in a, per in a patient now and apply in a patient in 10 days' time, I get the same result. So that's not really re reproducible research. That's a reproducible method, but it's not reproducible research. So reproducible research is making sure that a study can be rerun independently with the same modalities, and then when this is done, the same conclusions are reached by someone else. So there are two parts actually here, and uh, one is with the same modalities. What do I need? So I cannot use the same modalities if the methods are not shared, if we don't share the code, the tools, the procedures, if we don't share the data, and if there is undocumented human intervention, if a lot of your uh, data curation uh, uh, entails uh, you copy-pasting uh, data from uh, uh, an, uh, uh, Osiris uh, to Excel, then this part would not be reproducible. Someone else would do it differently. And then also we have to make sure that the same conclusions are reached. So if something is published, uh, uh, we have to make sure that uh, the data was not manipulated in some way that was not declared. The data was interpreted in the right way. The right tools were used. We are not uh, uh, harking means uh, hypothesizing after results are known. Uh, this is something that we uh, sometimes do, we, we don't know what we ex want to expect, we see a trend and then we say, oh, okay, then this must be a, th this maybe was my hypothesis all along, but it's not really like that, that uh, inferential statistics work. And then of course there is publication bias because uh, if 90 studies say that something is not like that and one study says that it is, then uh, uh, if I try to reproduce this one study, nine times out of 10 it will come out not the same conclusion. So what is reproducible research? It's a collection of ideas. It's open source methods, it's open data, it's pre-registration, it's registered reports, it's open access, because we also want things to be uh, uh, accessible. Um, by show of hands, just uh, out of curiosity, who knows what registered reports are? Ah, a few, I'm, I'm quite surprised. <laughs> This is something that we actually tried to implement for MRM. It didn't go through, but maybe uh, I will try to convince that uh, it's a good idea and uh, it should happen. Register reports, for those who don't know, is uh, a paper is judged only on, their on its methods and not on its results. So I declare what I'm going to do, and if it's rigorous enough and the question is important enough to be answered, then the paper will be published regardless of the positive or negative outcome. And I think that this is paramount for uh, uh, battling against uh, publication bias. But uh, uh, yeah, so a lot of good words, a lot of how the world should work, but uh, in the end, uh, why would you need to be the one that does it? I mean, let's leave the fight to someone else. No, I just have to do my research, I just have to get my tenure. And so uh, to quote this paper, Five Selfish Reasons to Work Reproducibly, that I invite you to read is, don't ask what you can do for reproducible research, ask what reproducible research can do for you. So it makes sense for you, even if you don't embrace the whole ideology to work reproducibly. And uh, I will go through some reasons that are not completely overlapping with the paper, but uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit why I do it. And uh, 
On the one hand, we want to be transparent because this helps collaborations. We, and uh, if, I, if my methods are open, some people can collaborate with me. And your closest collaborators is, is you in six months from now. If you're not uh, well documenting your code and you get uh, a paper uh, under revision and you have to do revision and then you don't remember how you did the figures, then this is going to be a problem and you're going to waste time. So if you well document this from the beginning, you will not have this problem. And then reproducibility avoids mistake. We want to remove the human as far as possible from uh, the pipeline. Everything uh, is good that it's automated because someone else can redo it. And again, you can redo it. And then, of course, it makes writing easier. If uh, the reviewer asks you to do things a little bit different, you just tweak your code a little bit. And then your paper is, uh, is again reproduced with the new figures, with the, with, the new, uh, wi with the new code, with the new data, and so on. So it, it's really a very good way to uh, streamline your own workflow. So regardless of being good for science, it's also good for you. And finally, reproducibility increases impact. And I'm amazed uh, there are many wonderful uh, open source projects. I uh, want to make a shout out to BART because I find it uh, fantastic. They have an active community. And uh, this is uh, just because it's open source. And a lot of projects are popular just because they're open source. Otherwise, nobody would use them. And I think that everybody here cares most about having our work reproduced, our, our code used, our methods uh, tried out in the wild. I think this is what we are really passionate about. In the end, uh, if a vendor uh, picks it up and buys the patent, uh, um, personally, it's secondary. I want people to actually use what I do. So I just uh, quickly talked to you finally about my latest reproducible project. This is also um, partly presented in a poster here on Wednesday. And this is Daphne. This is a, a collaborative, uh, lear uh, collaborative learning based segmentation platform. And uh, uh, we really made a lot of effort to make uh, this tool. It's a nice interface that integrates deep learning models and uh, I work on muscle imaging, so it's made for segmentation of the muscles. We released in summer 2021 and uh, we did it open from the start. So our very first uh, development was on GitHub. We created a repository and we put it there. So people saying, ah, but aren't you afraid that someone is going to scoop you and uh, make a better tool from your code? I said, yeah, I, I don't care. I mean, if they could, <laughs> I would be really happy because anyway, everybody knows that m the original code is my code. So they would uh, hopefully give me credit and we would collaborate and things would be better in the end. This didn't really even happen because <laughs> I ended up uh, still being the only developer there, but uh, at least everything is in the open and you can see all the commits and all the crappy code that I write. Um, and then we also did effort to really distribute it, make uh, a very nice documentation. Well, very nice, sorry, <laughs> I'm just praising myself. But uh, it's a <laughs> it is a website. We even have a chatbot. That's really cool. It's a GPT powered chatbot. If you go here and chat, uh, where is chat? Yeah, chat with Daphne. You can try it. It's Daphne.network. I really encourage because it's fun. Uh, and then we also put the validation code. So we wrote a paper that is still not accepted, by the way, just got rejected uh, <laughs> not too long ago, but we'll try again. Uh, and all the figures, uh, uh, all we collected data, so this is a collaborative learning platform. Uh, I will not go into detail, but people around the world use it. We have around 40 users. They segmented around 600 data sets over a period. And all these data that we collected, we put it on the web, and uh, the figures of the paper are just generated by a Jupyter Notebook, which is itself uh, released under a free license, of course, so you can reuse the figures independently of my, uh, of my paper. And uh, if I need to change anything, I just do it there. And again, nobody's going to scoop me. I mean, wh who wants to scoop the figures of this work that I have done that everybody knows is mine and it's just uh, there on GitHub? And finally, uh, we wrote a paper uh, which is uh, on archive, so you can read it and cite it. Uh, hopefully, you cite it a lot. Uh, and uh, yeah, then uh, of course, we'll try to publish in a journal, but now, even if it takes a year or so to publish in a journal, I don't care. It's already out there. It's already my work. Nobody can deny me that anymore. If I keep everything secret, then I really 
uh, have a risk that someone comes and publishes something like that before me. So to finish, we need to talk about creating a culture and how, uh, how did I enter in this culture? I, c I didn't create this culture. As you've seen, if anybody, John Ioannidis created it in 2005. But uh, I don't come from an open science friendly group. This was not uh, uh, a big thing in, uh, in, in the group that I made my career in. But I always had a passion for free software and for free knowledge. Uh, this book by Lawrence Lessig changed my life uh, when it came out. And then I started getting involved with the reproducibility study group and I found out that there were really a lot of similarly minded people and I was not alone being passionate about it. And uh, um, so we found, I found some people who were also interested in my university. We created the seminar series called Open Science, Principles and Practices for Better Research. We didn't know much, we just had a few names that we wanted to ask and uh, we asked people from all over the world to contribute. And uh, this is the fourth year, I think, that we are uh, doing it uh, in, uh, in autumn. Everything is on YouTube and uh, we have some amazing response. So next year, this is a seminar for our students. We have maybe 10 people joining plus people from the reproducibility network. And uh, next year, we are going to have the president of the American Statistical Association who is going to talk in, uh, in our seminar series. And then everything will be on YouTube. It's a great introduction to reproducible science if you want to check it out. And then, of course, the came, MRI Together came, uh, something that I consider really my baby. Actually, the idea was from Steven Surbron and Laura Bell. And it initially was an OZEP initiative, hopefully. All of you have uh, participated in it. It's a great event for open science in MRI, and I hope that uh, uh, you will be able to join this year as well. It's, it's happening again in December, so please come. So in conclusion, um, I hope that I conveyed a little bit that research, reproducible research is good for science, but it's also good for you and for me and for each one of us. So don't do it Oh, maybe do it because you believe in it and you believe in the bigger picture, but also do it because you believe in yourself and you want to do uh, better science for yourself and make life easier for yourself. And it's more than open source. As you have seen, uh, there is a lot to do it. There is publication bias that needs to be addressed. There is pre-registration, register reports, lots of tools out there that all belong to the concept of reproducible research, being able to put results out there that are actually uh, close, as close to reality as possible. And to start, the learning curve can be a little bit steep, but there are a lot of resources. We have the YouTube, we have the podcast of Reproducibility Study Group, and of course, we have the Reproducible Research Study Group that you are all very welcome to join. We have uh, a lot of uh, uh, great uh, uh, initiatives. I'm going to be past chair soon, uh, but uh, the team is fantastic and uh, we are a very welcoming community. Find your community in your university, in your ISMRM, in ISMRMB, wherever you are, look around you, you will find similarly minded people and uh, you will uh, enter this fantastic world that really uh, changed my research and also changed my life. Even. And uh, thank you and come to on Thursday to the business meeting and we can chat more. Last comic, if you want to read it, uh, maybe it's too small. Uh, thank you.